The coronavirus has been a challenge for community, for interacting with people. In the job that I've had during my career, I, I've worked in human resources and being connected to people is very important to me. Um, over the past couple of years, it's been a little bit hard, but um, sort of reconnecting with our small group now, um, you know, just has made it so clear how important it is to really be connected to other people and to build relationships with other people. So we started our small group around September and we've been adding some more people and it's at a real nice size. Um, we get chances to talk to each other about the word, about the study, but also getting to know each other. People tend to open up pretty, pretty readily with what's happening in their lives. And I feel like we're there, um, we're, we care about each other, we're getting to know each other better and um, we're there to support each other, you know, through the ups and downs of our lives and also learning more about the Lord and how to live our lives um, as He would want us to. As we think about what it means to become more like Jesus, because in the simplest terms, that's what a Christian is, is somebody who's come to the cross, received the grace of God, and now we're growing to be more like Jesus. But as you think about it, some of these things, a Bible engagement, passionate prayer, the things we've been talking about, those are things you can do pretty, you know, pretty comfortably over the last couple of years. But consistent community, that's been a tough one. <laughs> it's just been, and, and if, if you don't believe that consistent community is important, uh, read some of the studies on what's happening with young people and teenagers who've been blocked off from connection and blocked off from relationships. Even those who don't yet know Jesus, there's something in us that we know we're made for community, we're made to connect. And so we're thinking today about what does it look like to live in consistent community that honors Jesus, who's our model and our example of what it looks like to be in community. And so I began thinking about this and and I've got different moments in my life where I've experienced just, just kind of the, the sweetness and the beauty of community. One was, I've been a Christian for maybe two years. I was like about 17 years old, and a couple of friends of mine and I, we all played guitar, and we wanted to spend some time worshiping and just being in community together. So we went, or I think we, I think we went to Safeway, and we bought, each bought a, lo, a full loaf of King's Hawaiian bread and a full large thing of Welch's grape juice. And we each carried our sack with our, with our bread and our juice and our guitars. And we climbed up in the hills in Yorba Linda for about 15, 20 minutes, kind of in the middle of nowhere, and sat down there for about three hours. We sung praises to God. And we ate as much King's Hawaiian bread as we wanted. And we had as much grape juice as we wanted. Not a little cup like this, but as much as you can eat. And we just had communion. And I still, I can, I can right now I can just remember that moment and just feel the sweetness of the Holy Spirit with these two brothers in Christ just being in community together. But there's that same sweetness in other times. The last six weeks, I've been gathering with a group at my home in a small group going through organic disciples together. So, and we'll gather again tonight. And I know when we gather together, we'll, we'll have some refreshments together. We'll talk together. We'll share life, but we'll open the scriptures and we'll pray and we'll share about our lives and we'll learn about growing to be more like Jesus. And God will be present in that beautiful environment of community with God's people. I know that every time we gather on, on the first Wednesday of the month or we gather on a Sunday morning, whether, and together, whether you're online or outdoors or in the family worship venue or in the worship center, we're in different places. It's a different season in, in our world, but we are one family. We worship one God and we lift up our voices with one voice to God. Amen? And there's something about being part of the family of God that God's wired us for and designed us for. And I could, go, I could go on and on. I think of a, a great time of community I experienced with a group from Shoreline and some other churches and local firefighters who all got together. And I remember being over in, one, in a park in Seaside and we spent about two hours on our knees together. We weren't praying. We were actually kneeling down and sifting out the sand with these little strainers and taking out pieces of glass and all kinds of stuff and throwing it away and cleaning this park for the kids that live in that neighborhood and doing it in community with other churches other Christians, people from Shoreline Church, and some local community servants who just came and said, we want to be a part of this. And that was, there, there was a sense of the presence of the Spirit of God, and we were kneeling down to kind of sift out and clean the sand, but while I was on my knees, I prayed a lot for the community. I prayed for the kids that would play in that place. And there was a sense of being the community of God's people. It happens around tables, over meals. It happens in, in difficult and painful places. I remember when I got a call from a dear friend of mine who had, uh, when he found out he had stomach cancer, it was already in stage four. And this friend of mine and of Shoreline Church and of many of you, Nabil Qureshi, 
called me from the hospital in Houston. He'd been in this battle with cancer for quite a long time. And he just said, Kevin, could you and Sherry come and visit me? And I knew what he meant. He didn't say come and say goodbye, but that's what he was saying. And so we flew out to Houston, and we got to the hospital, and we spent about two hours with Nabil and with his wife Michelle and Sherry and I, and we talked, and we laughed, we told stories, we prayed, and the Holy Spirit of the living God showed up in that hospital room over that time. And when we said goodbye and left, it wasn't a lack of faith, but we knew we were saying goodbye to our friend. Not, I, I don't question God's power to heal. I've seen God heal, but this was a time where I just had a sense that the meal was going to go be with Jesus. But there was a sweetness of the community of God's people and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Do you know what I'm talking about? I hope you do. I hope you can say, I, I experienced that at different times in different places. There's something about being with the people of God when the Spirit of God is with us. And God wants that to be part of our lives. Consistent community is that journey of walking with the people of God in the sweet moments on a hilltop and in the deep valleys of a hospital room. But being the people of God and inviting the presence of God's spirit to be with us. And so as we do with every topic, when we talk about becoming more like Jesus, we begin with Jesus. We begin with the God that we worship. If we're gonna become like Jesus, we have to study his life and know what he was about. And here's my hope. I hope none of you, when you hear me preach or teach or when you see other Christians you learn from, I hope you learn from people and people mentor, disciple, encourage you in your faith, but I hope your goal is never to become like them. If any of you, if your goal is to become like me, I look sometimes and I think one of me is more than enough. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want anyone at Shoreline to become like Kevin. I want you to love Jesus. I want you to see his face. I want you to become more like the Savior. And we do that in community together. And so when we learn about community, we look first at Jesus. Then we took and say, how do I become like Jesus? How does my life become more like him? How do I live like him? And then how does being like Jesus shine the light of Jesus out into the world? You get that rhythm? Learn from Jesus, become like Jesus, go with Jesus into the world. That's the rhythm of our lives. And so when we look at who Jesus is and we look at the God that we worship, we, we learn that our God loves community. The God we gather to worship today absolutely loves community. He loves, he loves fellowship, connection in his own heart and for us. And what's interesting is if you look at different world religions and different philosophies, uh, when people invent their pantheon of gods, they, those gods always look a lot like the people who invent them. Before I was a Christian, I studied Greek, uh, I studied Greek and, um, and Roman mythology and I knew all the different, you know, I knew their whole pantheon of gods. I was only about 15 years old, but I found it very interesting. And what struck me was all the gods in the Greek pantheon and the Roman pantheon, different names for the same kind of characters, they fought all the time. They didn't like each other. They were at war. They looked a lot like people because <laughs> people had made them up. If you study Norse mythology or if you've watched any of the Thor movies, um, you, know, you, you know that like Thor and Loki, that, that, that they, they, they fought each other. There were, there's rivalry and tension and conflict. But you read this book, the Bible, this is not a book of people making up God. This is a book of God revealing himself. When people make up their gods, those gods fight and look a lot like people. But when God reveals himself, you see what he's really like. And what the Bible teaches us is that our God exists eternally as one, one in being, one God. We can, say, we can say with the great Jewish creed, the Shema, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. One God united. But that God exists eternally in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the God we worship is in perfect harmony and community eternally. Not at war, not fighting, not at conflict. But perfectly in community. God exists in perfect, eternal, Trinitarian community. If you're not sure if that's true, look at the very first book of the Bible, the very first chapter of the Bible. In Genesis chapter 1, we read these words as, as God is creating. And we read these words from Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in Our image. Why is God speaking in plural? Because he's one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let's make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may be rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Because God exists in perfect community, God created us in community and for community. And God said it's not good for man to be alone. He wants us to be in community and fellowship. 
So if you say, well, I want to learn how my life should look by looking at the God I worship, our God is a God of community. And then when God entered human history, he came among us as one who loved community. Jesus was committed to community and discipleship. The heart of Jesus when he walked on this earth, Jesus could have entered human history and kind of come into the world and said, I'm the king, I'm the ruler, you bow down to me and you'll work for me, but I'm not gonna have a relationship with you. No, Jesus came and said what? Follow me, walk with me. In, in, in Matthew chapter four, uh, when we see the, re, the, the calling of, of Simon and of Andrew, uh, Jesus basically, here's the call. He says, follow me, walk with me, come alongside of me, learn from me, share life with me. And that's exactly what they did. You mean Jesus, Emmanuel, God in human flesh, wanted to hang out with people? Share meals and tears and moments of joy? Yes. See, if you're, if you're gonna be a Christian, you have to become like Jesus. If you're going to become like Jesus, you have to understand what Jesus was like. And Jesus loved community. If anyone who walked this earth didn't need it, it was Jesus. But he loved fellowship, community, connecting with people. And if we're going to become like Jesus, we have to know how Jesus lived. We have to understand his heart. And then when Jesus established his mission in this world, he lived this life of community and connection, but before he ascended and went back to heaven, he instructed his followers how they were to bring about his mission. But, but listen to these words. If you have your Bibles, look at Matthew chapter 28. If you have your Bible app, you can, you can turn there. But in Matthew 28, Jesus paints this picture of them going on this mission, but his presence with them. Even after he ascends and goes to heaven, they're not gonna be alone. They're gonna be in partnership with Jesus. So in, Genesis, uh, in, in Matthew 28, I'll begin at verse 16. It won't be on the screen, but then we'll pick it up at verse 19 on the screen. But verse 16, it says this. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus, I have all the authority. I have all the power. Understand that. But then you pick it up in verse 19. Jesus, I have all the authority. Therefore, go make disciples. Therefore, you go and make disciples of all nations. And you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So Jesus says, okay, I have all power. I have all authority. Now I'm going to tell you how the mission is going to get done. You're going to go make disciples. You're going to baptize and you're going to teach people. And then Jesus circles back around to himself. And he says, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see the connection there? Even after Jesus, who, who lived in community, who loved community, even after he was ready to rise again, after he rose again, ready to ascend to heaven, he says, I want you to understand that this mission, we're gonna do it together in community. And then Jesus teaches us that the heartbeat of community is love, always. The heartbeat of community is love. You watch the life of Jesus. When you, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you study the life of Jesus, as he connected with people, love governed everything he did. Love was the driving force of his ministry and of his mission. So the heartbeat of community is love. Jesus loved every kind of person. You read the Gospels and you find that Jesus, Jesus loved and cared about people that were very wealthy and very well established and people who were struggling on the edges of society. Je Jesus, Jesus had the same care and concern for men or for women in a culture where women really didn't show up on the radar, but Jesus said, that's not the way it's supposed to go. Everyone matters. Jesus cared about the rich and the poor, the, the haves, the have-nots, everybody. That was the heart of Jesus. He loved everyone. And Jesus loved the forgotten. There were a lot of people in Jesus' day that were just sort of, they, they, they were on the edges of society. You kind of walk down the street and you kind of live your life. And then there's people just kind of off the radar, just caught the edges. Jesus always stopped and kind of turned and noticed those people and reached out to them. That's the love of Jesus. So he, he loved those who were kind of forgotten. And then Jesus loved the intentionally excluded and abandoned. People that were intentionally, corporately, in a communal way, excluded or abandoned. If a person had leprosy in the first century, they were a non-person. They, were they, they weren't just on the edges. They were like pushed outside the edges. And if you had leprosy, you would literally have to stay a certain distance away from all people. And if someone was coming near you and they didn't know you had leprosy, you would have to say out loud, unclean. And when somebody's coming, they'd stop and stay away from you. Could you imagine living your whole life, anytime any human being came near you, having to scream, unclean, stay away from me. Those people Jesus saw, and he walked 
through the unclean, through the shouts, don't come near me, through the social norms, and he touched them and healed them and loved them. That's Jesus. Now, remember, what we're trying to think about is how did Jesus live so we can become like Jesus? You start going, oh, that kind of love? That kind of community? Yes. That's his call in our lives. He loved everybody, the unprotected in his days. In Jesus' day, there were certain people that had no safety net. If, if you were an orphan, if you were a widow, there were certain groups of people that God, through the Old Testament, said, look out for these people. And Jesus, when he walked on this earth, looked out for because they, they were unprotected. There was no social safety net. There was no, if you show up, we'll take care of your medical bills. And if you don't have any money, well, there was none of that. But Jesus always looked out for those kind of people. That's the loving heart of Jesus. When we, before we talk about how am I going to live in community with others, I look at Jesus and say, how did he live? And this is a high calling. This is a bold calling to become like Jesus. And we have to understand also that Jesus understood the cost of community. Jesus knew the cost of community. He understood that if you open your arms and open your heart to people, you will get injured. That the only person who ever walked on this earth that was perfect and would not hurt you was Jesus himself. But Jesus came into this world and he opened his arms to people. He welcomed them in. And some of those people denied him. Some of those people abandoned him. Some of those people betrayed him deeply. Some of those people denied they even knew him. But Jesus opened his heart and his arms knowing that would happen. And he models for us to say, I know the community is dangerous, but it's worth it. It's worth it if you'll allow people to get close enough to you, even when it's dangerous, even when it's difficult. And Jesus knew Peter would deny him. Peter wasn't just like one of the disciples. He was, one, he was part of the Peter, James, and John. There were certain times in his ministry where Jesus would do something really important or significant, and he'd say, Peter, James, John, come along with me. And so certain healings, his transfiguration, certain times near the end of his life where he'd say to them, he'd pull them in. Well, it, it was Peter who was so close to Jesus that, that when someone said to him after Jesus had been arrested, said, hey, aren't you, someone said to Peter, aren't you one of those disciple guys? Aren't, weren't you with Jesus? And the first time Peter responds, he says, he says I, I, I don't know the guy. I don't know him. If you read all four Gospels and you see the tone of what happened, then another person comes and wait, no, you've got an accent. You, you, that's, that's a Galilean. No, you, no, you were with him. You were one of the disciples. The second time, Peter says, I swear I don't know him. Get stronger. A little later, someone comes and says, no, you, you're one of those disciples. You're one of those followers of Jesus. The third time, Peter's response was this. I swear I don't know the man. May I be cursed if I know him. I don't know Jesus. The third time it was that strong. And the Bible tells us that that moment, Jesus and Peter locked eyes because Jesus watched it all. As one of his closest friends publicly, repeatedly denied that he even knew him and said, if I know him, may I be cursed. Jesus knew if you open your heart to people and you open your lives to people, even good people, you're going to get hurt sometime along the way. And Jesus still did it. And he calls us to dare to be in community. Because Jesus understands if we live like this and like this, we're not going to have the kind of life he intends for us. We can isolate ourselves. We can push people away. We can guard our hearts. But Jesus modeled living like this all the way to the cross. All the way to the cross. Out of love for us. That's the heart of Jesus. So Jesus modeled community. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit modeled community. We're to become more like Jesus. So what does that mean? It means that God created you and me for community. Even if you don't like community, even if you're, you're more introverted, and you're, you're, I prefer to kind of be not around people very much, no matter how you're wired, if you're a follower of Jesus, you come to understand that God has designed you and created you to be in community. In Romans chapter 12, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Romans 12, three through five. The apostle Paul is talking about the idea of the church being like a body. I read a passage at the beginning of the service about this and, and 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12 have the same theme. It says our physical body has lots of different parts, but we form one person. It says so the church has lots of different people, but we form one spiritual body. So listen to these words from Romans 12, beginning in verse three. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. 
For just as each of us has one body, physical body with many parts, many members, and these members, these parts of our body, not all have the same function. Now here's the connection to the spiritual reality. So in Christ, as Christians, though many, we form one body. And listen to this. And each member belongs to all the others. Well, that's uncomfortable. If you buy the world's you know, line that, hey, it's all about me and mine, closest to me, not everybody else. And then the Bible says, no, if you're a Christian, you're part of a body, you're part of a family, and you belong to each other. Not just at Shoreline Church, but with Calvary Church down the street, and Cypress Church down on Highway 68, and Monterey Church over here in Monterey, and Carmel Presbyterian Church, and Wellspring Church. Those are all churches that I know the pastors well, delight in the ministries that God is doing in those places. They're part of our family. Well, it's not just Monterey. It's the Christian church all over the world. That's, and, and, and listen to this. Each member belongs to all the others. We're connected. Even if you don't like community, guess what? You're part, if you're a Christian, you're part of it. The question is, are you an active part of it? Are you engaging in what God has for you? In this passage, we're, we're encouraged to have sober judgment, to recognize that you know, I'm not all that and I'm not separate from everybody else. I'm not above everybody else. There's an image of the body that, that like a physical body, we're different people, but we are connected and we're bound together. The, the physical body has a nervous system and all these connectors and the church is like that too. We belong to each other. And that's God's design for us. That's what he wants for us. And this passage is as clear as you can get. That Jesus is saying, connecting it, you know, community matters more than anything else. Throughout, this theme is throughout the Bible. And, and we live in a, in a very individualistic culture and world. But when you're a Christian, you recognize that, no, we actually, Jesus lives in community. I need to live and walk in that community. So when Jesus is asked by the religious leaders who are really trying to kind of, trying to catch Jesus up and they're sort of on the attack against him, and they come trying to trip him up, but they ask him, what's the most important of all the law, of all the prophets? What's most important? And Jesus says these words in Mark chapter 12. This is verses 29 to 31. They say, what's the most important law in everything, that the, in the law and the prophets, all that's come before, what's most important? And Jesus says, the most important one, answered Jesus, Mark 12, 29, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, the unity of our God. And then he says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. What does Jesus say? What's most important? Community, connection, relationship with God vertically. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? And then horizontally, love your neighbor as yourself. And the cross becomes that connecting point of heaven and of earth and love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. To walk in community is to live the way God's called us to live in communion with God and in community with each other even when it's hard. That's the heart of God. That's the desire of God. So what do you do if right now you're saying, and, may, and you're online, I hope you haven't, haven't logged off. If you're here, you, I hope you haven't mentally shut off. What if you do say, but I don't, I don't like community. I'm better on my own. I've been a pastor in full-time ministry press in 40 years now. And so I've been, I've been serving in the church since I was 16 years old. And I've met a lot of people who say exactly that. I don't need the church. I don't need other Christians. I've been burned by Christians enough times. I don't need that. I'm good. It's me and Jesus and Jesus and me and thank you very much. We're good. Right? I've heard a lot of that through the years. And when I hear that, it breaks my heart because I know it breaks the heart of God. And I know always it's come from this. This is a person who at one point along the way, they opened their arms and their heart and their life to other Christians. And they got burned. They got hurt. And they said, that's it, I'm done. But Jesus kept his arms open all the way to the cross, kept his heart open all the way so that all could believe if they would just receive his grace. And that's our example. So if you look and say, man, I've been burned, I've been hurt, that's, that's not for me. Um, I, I wanna acknowledge some things. I wanna acknowledge that community, when we're in community with other people, community is broken because of sin. There's gonna be brokenness, there's gonna be pain. Community is complicated. It is complicated to say we belong to each other. We're a family. That's complicated. And community is painful. Community can be deeply painful. I wrote down, not full names, but I wrote down six different, as a sample for myself in my notes as I was thinking and praying, preparing for this message, six different people or couples who have 
in my years of ministry have come against me in some of the harshest, most mean-spirited, vicious ways you can imagine. These are all people who are part of the church, who I served alongside of, either, either uh, as a volunteer, as a staff person, opened my heart, opened my life, and something happened along the way where they just became really angry and, and vicious and attacked. And, and each time it's happened for me, and it's, it's more than just those ones, the names there, but each time it's happened, I always stop and look, Lord, what was my part? And where did I mess up? And I can always, I can always, I can always own part of it. Trust me. In any conflict with any person, part of it's me. But in a number of these cases, it was like, man, they, they kind of lost it, went off in a really unfair way. And as a pastor, I know pastors who are still in the pulpit preaching, but they're preaching like this. They've closed off. They're not living like this anymore. And I want to say, I understand the pain that comes by being part of the church. We've all experienced, if you're around people long enough, you're going to feel pain because people are imperfect. As a pastor, you feel it, but you make a decision. Community with the people of God is worth you know, saying, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to live like this. I'm going to be part of the family of God. And I won't guarantee you if you do that, you won't get hurt. What I can probably guarantee you is somewhere along the line, you will. It happens. We're, we're broken people. But you continue to stay part of community because it's God's design for us. And there's power in community. The enemy, the enemy of our souls loves to mess with us and get us out of community. Satan does not want you part of Christian community. And if you're online, you're part of another church, I want to say to you, if you're, you're connecting your church and your community where you are, even when it's hard, the enemy wants to isolate you and get you alone because you're an easier target. Don't let him do it. Stay in the strength of God's people, even with all of our struggles and imperfections. And, and so we begin with saying, okay, the God that we worship exists in the eternal Trinitarian community. Jesus came to this world. He lived in community. He loved community. He kept his heart open. We want to become like Jesus. So he said, okay, now I need to grow in community. I need, to, I need to be intentional about taking my next step into being part of God's community. If you're a note taker, write, I'm going to give you four things you can write down, four ideas for stepping a little bit more into community. Just maybe a little practical thing you can, and especially hopefully coming out of this time of COVID, hopefully connecting more face to face with people. And I'm hoping you can take some of these steps. But here's the first one share a meal with somebody. Jesus did. You read the Gospels. Jesus loved sharing meals with people. Invite someone over for dinner. If you're nervous about being in your house, then find a nice day. And we, we're, we're in Monterey. It gets nice sometimes around here. Do an outdoor dinner if you need to. Whatever, but get together and share a meal and tell stories and share life and laugh together and pray together and say, how are you doing? And if somebody says, man, I've been struggling, pray for him and, and just share, be, be God's people together. Share a meal. Jesus did. It's a great way to connect. Take a walk. Do a study through the gospels and see how many times Jesus was walking with people as they were sharing community. That's a lot going from place to place. Now, we live in a different culture, so maybe it's, drive, it's taking a driver, but I, I think there's something about taking a walk where you slow down and just interact with people. I challenge you to call someone and say, hey, let's take a walk. Maybe somebody who's been part of your life as a Christian and you haven't seen him for six months or two years. And, and if you want to you know, just say, hey, can we take a walk in the Fort Ord Hills? Can we take a walk, a walk along the ocean? And just block out an hour and maybe, and I'm going to get crazy here, leave your phone in the car. Oh, that's okay. I've got all my watch. Oh, take the watch off and put it in the car. You know, go. I got a series coming up called Unplug. We'll talk about that in a little more detail. But, but, um, but just maybe just say, wait, maybe because you know people used to take walks without phones with them. In my lifetime, you couldn't take a phone with you unless you had a cord that went four miles. Okay, I mean, it's, but, so it's okay. It's okay. Well, but there's an emergency. I'm needed. Not so much. Um, just take a walk. You know, be with people. Enjoy life with other people who love Jesus. Give a blessing, Jesus did. One of the gifts of community is you can look at another person and say, do you know what you mean to me? Do you know what God does in my life because of you? Do you know what praying with you for your husband the other day when he was in a tough time meant to be in community? You know, do you know what it means to say, hey, it's been a long time since we've got together as families and spent time together. Let's hang out. And just to say, you, you're a blessing to me and I want to bless our, our words have so much power. And we're in this tense season where everyone's fighting about stuff. But bring words of blessing. And can I tell you a little secret? Every person you know, every Christian you know, if you're a Christian, every Christian you know, there's things you can find about them you can nitpick and point out that's wrong. Every single person, including me. You can do that. But there's also things you can bless. Find the good and bless it. And speak that grace and speak that contact. I, 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 actually, I'm, I just... I saw Marion Pena back here. And Marion, you, you bless me every time I see you. I know you bring, you bring roses mostly to ladies and stuff. I don't get roses very often from you. But you walk around this church and you, you bless 
every person you can. That's one of the gifts of community. Find reasons to bless people. Use your words. Find some way to encourage them and build them up. And then gather with the family. Jesus did. There was something about Jesus loved being together with the people of God. And I want to, and I want to say, there's, we're in a unique time. We had one point along the way where we were doing nine different kinds of gatherings at Shoreline, from online to outdoors in the family worship venue to indoors family. We had an outdoor and indoor family worship venue to in cars to in the courtyard. To, I mean, we had nine different ways we were doing services because we want to meet everyone where they're at. And we, right now we're doing services in four different ways. And we'll keep doing whatever it takes to minister to people wherever they're at. But I want to give an invitation, especially if you're, if you're online. If you're online out of the country, out of the area, stay online. And we want to, we're doing all we can to connect you with great services and make you feel as a part of things as we can. But if you're local and you can gather with us for worship and you've just gotten comfortable you know, eating, eating your Lucky Charms during service and, uh, and doing your laundry and, whatever, and, and, and you're like, I, could, I want to challenge you. If you're local and you don't need to be home, Come back and connect on Wednesday night classes, Sunday morning services, nights of worship, children's youth. There's something about being together if you can be. Some can't, that's understood. But if you can, let's gather back together. But to, but to gather with God's people, gather with the family. And then we understand that if Jesus modeled perfect community and we're seeking to live in community, then there's something about our community that becomes a light to the world. As a matter of fact, I believe the way we love each other and our community as God's people is one of the greatest witnesses to the world. And we have a special opportunity to show the world the presence of Jesus because we're not going to fight with each other over stupid things as Christians. We're going to love each other even when we don't always agree on everything. That's something we're striving to do as a congregation. So God uses our community to reveal his presence and his power out into the world. The way we love each other, the way we are community actually is a witness to the world. In John 13... In verse 34, so Jesus has already washed the disciples' feet. He sat back at the table. He's told them, I've washed your feet. You should wash each other's feet. Uh, Humble service. And then we read these words in verse 34 of John 13. And it says, a new command I give you. Jesus is speaking. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. Well, that's a lot of love. The way Jesus has loved us. That's our model, right? That's, That's quite a standard. But look at verse 35. By this... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. What's Jesus saying? How are you going to show the world that you're a follower of Jesus? How you love each other. You know what Jesus didn't say? He didn't say, if you have great doctrine and great theology, the world will know that you follow me. Now, I'm a huge fan of great doctrine and great theology. But Jesus said, that's not what Jesus said would show the world his presence. What is it? How we love one another. Jesus didn't say, it's by your holy lives and when you point out to other people how unholy they are, then they'll see that you follow. It doesn't say that. Now, we should live holy lives and our lives should show the light of Jesus, absolutely. But when Jesus was gonna say, if there's a picture of what shows the world that you are my people, this is the picture. How you love each other. How you do community as my people. That reveals the presence of Jesus to our world. It opens up doors for spiritual conversations where people say, why, you know, well, you don't, you don't get along with all those people. You don't agree with all them. Well, I don't, but we're, we're family. We belong to Jesus together. We worship him and serve him together. That's who we are. And, and so just to understand that, that Jesus calls us to love one another in a way that shows the world his presence. Community is the longing of every human heart. Every human heart is designed for community. Even the most introverted, quietest of people they were still made by God for community. And there's something within them that longs for that so that when they see us being community and loving each other, even though we come from different walks of life and different perspectives and we don't, you know, we agree on the core things about our faith, but there's things in our world right now that people are dividing over that are so silly and trivial and there's people that won't speak to each other, that hate each other, that draw lines between people. And as Christians, we're saying, no, that's not who we are. We're bound together in Jesus. And by the way, our unity in Jesus is greater then all the other silly things are dividing people. Can I get an amen? Amen. I mean, if our unity in Jesus can't hold us together, nothing can. And that unity will be a witness to our world. And so we have to walk in that and live in that. It's the longing of every heart. I want to give you an encouragement to make your home a lighthouse. The way that you love others whether, whether you live in a, in a trailer, whether you live on a boat out on the, in the harbor, whether you live in a neighborhood with tightly packed homes or kind of sparsely, you know, around whatever, whether you live on a military base, wherever you are. What if every home, every apartment, every place, somebody who's part of Shoreline, 
every place we lived was actually a little lighthouse shining the light of Jesus right there. And we were loving each other and living as Christians in a way that honors Jesus and connecting with other Christians in a way that shows that we're united in his love and his grace. And we're shining the light of Jesus right there. That would, that would create thousands of little lighthouses of the presence of Jesus all over Monterey. That's the heart of God. Turn your home into that kind of place and ask yourself, in my home, if, there's more, if I'm there alone, hopefully I'm getting along with everybody. Think about that for a while. Um, if you're living alone and you can't get along with the people you live with, you've got issues. Uh, but, but, but if you're living with other people who know Jesus, how do you love each other? How do you live that? Do you become a witness of loving one another in the name of Jesus? And then, I encourage you in partnership with everyone who's part of this church to make Shoreline Church a beacon of community light. To say, God, let the light of Jesus shine into our world. Jesus loved community. He walked in community. He calls us to live in community. So now, Lord, let our community as a, as a people of God shine the light of Jesus out into, this na- into our neighborhoods, into families and, and, and hurting people and, and people who look like they have it all together, but they're lonely in their hearts. So make Shoreline Church a beacon of community light. How do we do that? Well, we show love in action. We serve our community together in the name of Jesus. And things are opening up to where we're actually getting ready to start relaunching some of our ministries where for the longest time we couldn't go into retirement centers and and pray for them and care for them. But as soon as we can, we're back in there, right? That's what we do. We're the church. There's been different, we've continued our food pantry, our clothing closet, but there's other things that have been shut down. But man, we're gonna shine the light of Jesus by showing love in action. And we're gonna serve and work in our community and do, do it together so that as we're serving Jesus together, the world looks on and says, man, I want some of that. I long for that. Where do you get that kind of connection? And it's through Jesus. How do we make sure on the beacon of community light? Relentless forgiveness. If you have anybody who's part of this church or another Christian church, and you're at odds with them, then in the name of Jesus, work it out. Do your best. I had one guy that was so upset at me. It was one of the, one of the guys on my list there. He uh, was one of my closest friends. At this church I served, uh, this 20 five, 26 years ago. And when I, God opened the door for me to start doing some writing and some other ministry, he said, no, you serve only our church. You can't go to other churches and speak. You can't write stuff. You, have to, you, we, you, know, you belong to us kind of a thing. And I'm like, well, that's kind of creepy. And, uh, and I was like, you know, he's re- possessed. And I said, listen, I feel God's calling to broader ministry. I said, I'm going to serve this church like crazy. I'm going to give everything I can, but I'm going to also do some other stuff. And it ended our relationship. And he, and his, and he wanted to leave the church. And his wife said, no, we're not leaving the church. Or if you do, you're leaving without me and without the kids. So he stayed in the church, but he never, for three years, he never looked at me. I'd see him in the hall, I'd say, hi, by name, I'd say, hi, and he'd walk past and look down, wouldn't look at me when I'd preach. He'd be sitting, like, his wife sat right over there in that church, and she'd look up, and the kids would look up when I was preaching, and he'd look down at his feet, the entire sermon would never look up. For three years, this went on. And I actually said to him, I said, listen, my arms are open when you're ready to reconnect. That's all I can do. I, mean, I couldn't keep knocking on the door because he had blocked me out. But I said, my arms are open whenever you're ready. And about three years later, he called me on a Sunday, he said, can I come over to your house? I said, please. He came over, I opened the door, and he just said, I'm so sorry, I've been such an idiot. And he started kind of confessing some stuff, and I said, hey, listen, come on in, sit down. And God restored the relationship, but it took, it took three years. But here's the point. I said to him, I'm here. I can't, I, 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 I'm not gonna hold animosity, but I can't force you to have relationship. Do your part to reestablish forgiveness with a person. Re-establish. And if, if they won't, you say to them, listen, I want you to know my door's open, my phone's on, my arms are open whenever you want to work it out. And you kind of take the ball and you toss it in their court and you go, when you're ready, here I am. Got it? But, but do your part. Because forgiveness models the love of Jesus and that shines a light into the world that's very, very unforgiving. And then unity and disagreements. This is huge. If we can stay unified when there's disagreements, we can be a witness to our community. And we're in a time with incredible contention over all kinds of stuff. And can I tell you something wonderful over the last two years? Our church leadership team, which is, is a, team, a team of uh, volunteers from our congregation, people just part of the church that are the, you know, kind of the primary lay leadership team on our church with, with some pastors along with that group and a couple of our leaders. Um, the last two years, we have sat and had hard conversations about, you, you can guess what the topics are because they're the topics that the whole world's been talking about for the last two years. And a lot, of those, a lot of those topics are conversations. If you're on this side or this side, then you now have to hate each other. You can't talk to each other. You're divided. It's been just, it's been heartbreaking to see how Satan has gotten a foothold and torn families apart and friends apart and churches apart. Can I tell you something? In the last two years, not one of our leadership team members has quit our board. Not one of them has left the church. 
Not, not one of them has gotten up during a meeting and got up angry and marched out. And we have had conversations where we'll have like three or four on this side. Well, I really see it more this way. I see it more this way. But we don't yell and scream. We talk, we pray, we work it through, we make decisions, and then we stand together as leaders. Because what binds us is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love of Jesus Christ, and the glory of God. And masks or no masks, or vaccines, or this position or that position, I mean, you name any of a dozen things that hit us the last two years, those all pale in comparison to the glory of Jesus. And so your leaders have stood together, and we prayed, and our staff, is, we have not had anybody on our staff quit staff because of this, any of those topics, because we keep Christ in the center. And if the world watches Christians quibbling and fighting and hating each other over those things, how does that draw them to Jesus? But if the world watches us have different perspectives, disagree, have honest conversations, but say, but I love you and we're family, that is a witness to the world. We can shine the light of Jesus by how we live in community with each other. And then collaborative service. We can serve together. And when we serve together in this community, we reveal Jesus. When, when, the, when our community sees Christians come together and serve and help and care and pray and give and do all the things we do, and there's lots of things Shoreline does and we're gonna be, you know, continue doing. When we offer different ministries for children and for youth and say, anyone can come, you're all welcome and you can be welcomed here and embraced in this church, that speaks to our community. And so, this, so I, wanna, I wanna encourage every person, whether you're online or on campus, we have set up a very specific way that you can actually today pause and say, do I need to be part of the community of God's church in a deeper level that will shine the light of Jesus into our community? And if you're open to that, if you're on campus, whether you're outdoors, family worship venue, in the worship center, before you leave, we actually ordered extra donuts today, more coffee. We're reopening all of our hospitality after the service. So if you're on campus, you'll stick around for 10 minutes and go out in the courtyard and we have booths that talk about all, you know, and, and we've got booths that will tell you about a, conf, a, conf, a women's conference happening here at Shoreline in a few weeks from now. Kids, things we have to reach kids, middle school, high school, young adults, small groups, Wednesday nights at Shoreline, cla or Wednesday uh, classes that happen between nights of worship, men's Bible studies, marriage. We have two things coming up for married people that would, and you can invite non-church people to, uh, lay counseling to help care for people. In time, and, and that's a sampling. We have booths out there that have all those different things. If you're on campus, take 10 minutes and just wander around and check those out and say, Lord, is there something here for me? If you're online, we have all those exact same things online for you on the homepage of our website. At the bottom, there's two things that you can click on that talk about community. Check both of those. I did this morning. There's a bunch of stuff there. Click there and you can kind of tour through what's going on. And then contact us during the week and say, hey, I want to know more about this. We can witness to our community by the way we live in community. And then the last thing I want to say is this that the presence of the Holy Spirit is revealed in our community. When, we, when we're together as God's people, God shows up. When two or more are gathered, there he is in the midst. And so when we're living our lives in community and the Spirit of God is present, and I've seen this happen many times, non-believers who are in that mix and God's people are there and God is there by his Spirit, there's non-believers that say, this is, God, this is just, there's something that feels good about this. Something, this is, man, there's just a way you love each other. There's, just some, there's something, they can't even put words to it, but it's the presence of the Spirit of God. We can bring the presence of God into our world. Before people ever come to church, ever really know about Jesus, we, when we're being the people of God together, the Spirit of God comes among us, and there's a sweetness and a presence of people. If somebody says, what is, what's going on? There's just something, why am I so drawn to this? I say, well, I think part of it's because God is here. And you're starting to feel and experience that. I've said that to people who've actually said, yeah, I think that's what it is. I don't know if I believe yet, but yeah, there's something going on. And so Lord, this is our prayer. Spirit of the living God, descend on your church. We all confess right now, we are imperfect. We understand that when we open our arms wide, there's gonna be some pain along the way of our hearts open to people. And we also confess, God, that sometimes we're the one who brings pain to someone else. But we want to be your church. We want to be your people. We want, to, we want to thrive in consistent community that shows the presence of Jesus. So Jesus, thank you for showing us what it looks like to walk in community. May we grow more and more in love with your people, even when there's hurt and brokenness. May we press into community and may the way we love each other show the world that Jesus, you are alive and you are real. We pray this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Two invitations before I send you off with a word of blessing. 
Number one, if you, are, if you need prayer, if you're online, just follow email or phone number you can call and we'll pray for you online or live on the phone. If you're on campus anywhere, we're, worship, we're asking you to come forward in the worship center and we'll pray for you here. And if you're new on, online, just text the word welcome. We want to greet you personally uh, through, the e- you know, through, through email. And if you're on campus, just go by the Connection Center right through the lobby here and we want to welcome you there and give you a little gift and thank you for coming. If you're able to stand online or on campus, stand with me and let me send you off with a word of blessing. As we close this time, may you go in the presence of the God who lives in perfect community, led by Jesus who loved and lived in community. May you have the courage to open your arms as wide as Jesus did and let your heart and life be open to be in community with the people of God. And then may your community shine the light of Jesus into a dark and lonely world that needs to know that God is present among his people. Amen? Amen. God bless you. Have a great day, and we will see you next Sunday.